I'm back. Uh, you probably heard the phone ring on that last uh, video clip, and uh, so I've got that taken care of, and I'm back. And I was just talking about the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan, which is used, by the way, in Kansas, except Governor Brownback is not a huge fan of the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan, and his objection is not so much to the voters voting on retention. His objection is to the list prepared by a committee of lawyers that is the list of judges from whom he can select. Uh, and so he um, has changed, he's gotten the state legislature to change the way judges to the Kansas Court of Appeals are appointed. Uh, instead of using merit selection, the system for Court of Appeals in Kansas is now like the federal system. There, uh, there's no more list. Uh, the governor appoints whomever he or she wants to appoint, and the state senate votes to confirm, and then there is no retention vote by the voters. Uh, and he appointed his ally Caleb Stiegel to the Court of Appeals, and then a year later um, he appointed Stiegel to the Supreme Court. Stiegel was one of the three names on the list uh, for finalists for the Supreme Court. However, that surprised a lot of people because Stiegel didn't have nearly as much experience as a judge as the other two on the list. One of the other two, by the way, was an Emporia State grad uh, named Merlin Wheeler. Um, and um, so there was uh, some thinking that maybe uh, that Brownback had encouraged some folks to put Stiegel's name on the list, but we can't we can't prove that to be fair. Uh, but it, it surprised a lot of people that Stiegel was on there with judges that had a lot more experience as judges. Stiegel's background was actually working as a county prosecutor in uh, in Jefferson County, Kansas, near Topeka. Um, so Kansas is changing, but most Kansas judges are still uh, appointed on the uh, merit selection plan. However, there are some local judges in the state of Kansas who are elected, and those are nonpartisan elections. Now, some states elect all their judges, and that can be partisan or nonpartisan. Uh, if it's nonpartisan, candidates run for judge like they'd run for office, but no party labels. It's just your name, and then you have different names to choose for each vacant judgeship. But under the uh, partisan election system, which is used in Ohio, among other states, uh, the candidates will actually run for judges, Democrats or Republicans. And so they'll use that party label, and they'll actually fundraise. For example, uh, candidates running for judges, Democrat, tend to raise a lot of money from labor unions and trial lawyers, and candidates running for judges, Republicans, will raise a lot of money from business groups, um, because that goes down to the, the partisan split in how um, how different judges and juries too tend to side. Democrats tend to lean more toward the plaintiff and Republican more toward the defendant. Not always, but often in civil lawsuits. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to appoint judges. Um, and I just think it's fascinating this idea that you would elect someone a judge as a Democrat or Republican. And this is your class discussion topic for the day. Um, now, there are some other systems here. For example, some states uh, let uh, the governor choose directly. They just let the governor just flat out choose the judge. And, uh, and then in one state, the state of South Carolina, the state legislature chooses the judges. And um, here's a surprise. Many of the judges in South Carolina are former state legislators. In other words, the state legislature chooses their own colleagues who have retired from the legislature or who are willing to do so in order to become judges. Uh, South Carolina is the only state that does that. They have an old school constitution in South Carolina that gives the legislature a lot more power than the governor, more like the way uh, the colonial era United States was, not like in the modern day where the executive, the president, and the governors have become a lot more powerful. Not as much so in South Carolina. They do it the old way. Um, and uh, then once again, the federal law is that the president appoints and the Senate confirms with two-thirds majority the judges. Usually judges get confirmed. That's not the problem. The problem is when the Senate doesn't bring it up for a vote at all. And that goes with that backlog in the state court system. Now, technically, as Alexander Hamilton famously pointed out in the Federalist Papers, uh, judges don't actually technically serve for life. 
they serve for good behavior. That means that the option is open to impeach judges if they do something that is an egregious violation of the law or their duties as judges. Impeachment of judges is very, very rare, but it's not completely unheard of. Um, now, in the states, on the other hand, some states have mandatory retirement ages for judges. Uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court, on the other hand, it's not at all unusual for judges to serve until they're in their 80s or even in some cases in their 90s. In many states, they couldn't do that because there's a mandatory retirement age, 65, 70 years old. Now, that's not true in all states, but it's true in some. And so that's my lecture for today on state courts. Now what I would like for Ryan to do is lead you all in a discussion of what do you think is the best way for states to choose judges? Do you think that we should use merit selection of the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan? The governor appoints uh, from a list prepared by a committee of lawyers and then the voters vote to retain? Do you think that we should elect judges but without the party label? Just the name, the way, say, members of the Emporia City Commission, including the mayor, are elected, or the way most school boards are elected? You vote, but there are no party labels. Um, do you think that um, there should be party labels as an information shortcut, so to speak, for the voters to get an idea of what the different judge uh, candidates stand for? Um, do you think that we should use the federal system, which is what Governor Brownback moved to, moved Kansas to with the support of the legislature, um, for appellate court judges? The governor appoints and the um, Senate confirms and we get rid of this uh, panel of lawyers that choose a list of three candidates for the governor. Uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton famously wrote in the Federalist Papers that the strength of the courts was that the judges served for good behavior, that the court's job is not to rule on public opinion, but to rule on the law, and that's why judges should not be voted upon and why they should serve for life or good behavior. But some elected officials are not too sure about that, and not all states do it that way. Uh, many elected officials have argued that uh, courts get out of hand, they start making the law instead of interpreting it, they do things that are overwhelmingly against public opinion, and the voters need some way of holding them accountable the way the voters did in California when they turned out those judges that ruled against the death penalty, or like they tried to do in Iowa when there was a push to turn out the judges that ruled in favor of same-sex marriage. Uh, most of the critics who do not uh, like the idea of the judges serving for life or good behavior tend to be on the Republican side. We tend to hear more often the voices of Republicans saying, I think the people should be able to vote on the judges, hold them accountable. There needs to be something we can do about out of control, judges and court rulings. Um, but there's also an argument liberals and some conservatives will make that, well, no, uh, Alexander Hamilton was right. The courts need some insulation between themselves and the voters uh, because ruling on the law doesn't always mean doing what's popular. But on the other hand, shouldn't people have some way to hold the courts accountable? That's what the debate is about. So now it's your turn. So Ryan, uh, thank you very much for substitute teaching the class today. I know the class is in good hands, and I now ask you to lead the students in a discussion of um, which method of selecting judges they think is the best one, and uh, maybe write down a few notes, and I look forward to finding out from Ryan early next week uh, what you all talked about and what conclusions you came to or what opinions were expressed. Uh, I will see you all on Monday.